so again, thanks a lot. Uh, my name is Don. I'm from the Laboratory of Sedimentary Archaeology at the University of Haifa. Uh, today I want to talk a little bit about some of my recent research. Uh, it's all about method development. So I've just finished up the experimental phase of the research. Uh, currently organizing some archaeological case studies uh, to test these methods out on. Uh, before we get into the laboratory results though, um, We'll have a little bit of background on the importance of salmon. Uh, 40,000 years ago in the southern Caucasus, uh, we know that people were uh, fishing for massive Black Sea salmon. This is actually the earliest evidence that I'm aware of uh, for the use of salmon resources. The really interesting thing here, though, is that I mean, people were investing a lot of time and energy and technology into catching these uh, high cost resources. So this actually fits in quite nicely with what we already know about uh, the development of broad spectrum subsistence strategies uh, during this time frame. And it's really interesting because of course we know that these strategies uh, led to uh, the socio-cultural developments we see happening throughout the Upper Paleolithic. Of course, there's a very wide diversity of salmonid species like Atlantic salmon, uh, Chinook, Chum, uh, Arctic char, rainbow trout. They're very widely distributed across much of the northern coast and connecting rivers. And these resources, of course, were very important for many people living in these places. Uh, first and foremost, obviously, uh, the meat, very important source of protein, a uh, very important source of omega-3 fats, vitamin B12. Uh, perhaps even more importantly, it's a very important source of vitamin B5 and potassium, uh, which is very important for northern hunter-gatherers who don't really have all that much access to a variety of fruits and vegetables. Then there's the oil. Uh, of course, the oil is useful as a food, but also it was very useful as a waterproofing agent. Also, it was also an outstanding accelerant, and you can use this to start fires in wet conditions. We also know that in many places, like along the northwest coast of North America, oil was a highly valued trade good and it was traded along the coast. Uh, from this, uh, we see the salmon oil being associated with wealth and prestige. Even the skin was a highly valued resource. Uh, in Alaska, we know that the Yupik people uh, use salmon skin to make waterproof parkas, and boots, and bags, things like that. <clears throat> of course, salmon has been an important part of the Japanese economy for well over 10,000 years. Uh, by the middle Joman period, about 6,000 years ago, uh, we know that people were hunting massive amounts of uh, salmon by installing these guiding fences across rivers. This is an actually a, a drained river here that they've been excavating. One of these features uh, has a site right next to it. At this site, there are thousands and thousands of cranial bones and teeth from chum salmon. Uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of post holes, uh, of course, interpreted as uh, drying racks and, of course, thousands of stone blades uh, used for processing. So, obviously, this site is interpreted as a, as a seasonal uh, harvesting and processing camp. And because of the abundance of chum, uh, it's interpreted that it was occupied during the late fall when these species were having their run. Along the northwest coast in North America, um, we know that mass salmon and harvesting was well underway by about 7,000 years ago. A really interesting site, the Keatley Creek site on the Fraser River. Uh, it's a pretty old site, but about uh, 2,500 years ago, uh, we see something really interesting happening at this site. Uh, we see people becoming much more sedentary. Uh, estimates have the population of this site at this time at around 1,000 permanent occupants. Uh, making it probably one of the largest hunter-gatherer camps uh, in the in the area, probably all of Canada. The community was supported by large-scale harvesting of uh, Chinook salmon and coho. Surpluses were built in the fall. They were dried. Some of these were even traded along the coast. 
the interesting that we the interesting thing that we see developing from this is uh, the formation of uh, corporate groups. So several families are coming together to form these groups, and then along with that, we start to see social differentiation, and then the beginnings of complex hunter gatherers that are famously from the northwest coast. <clears throat> In North Greenland, we have a culture we call the Independence One. Um, these people included Arctic char in their diets. And you can imagine accessing this resource in this environment uh, would have been quite difficult. But, I mean, these people, they really had to go the distance. They had to develop technologies, uh, social networks. They had to gain landscape knowledge that allowed them to diversify and uh, maximize resource exploitation in this environment. It's a kind of a marginal, a marginal environment. Of course, fishing was an important part of this. So from these examples, I think that it's pretty clear that salmon was a very important resource to many northern hunter-gatherer groups. And the presence of salmon bone on archaeological sites can tell us a lot about uh, dynamics in settlement and subsistence strategies. The problem is, though, is that we're not so lucky to, uh, you know, have such great preservation in a lot of other places and at a lot of other time depths. Um, fishbone preservation can be very problematic in some places. In the North American Arctic, uh, we know that several salmon species were available uh, in eastern Beringia, but we don't really know that much at all about how people were exploiting these resources in the area. We don't know much at all about how these resources influence their mobility strategies, uh, things like this. So sites in this area of the age of about 10 to 15,000 years, there's virtually no fish bone present. And this is thought to be the result of poor preservation. We have the same story in the Arctic Archipelago uh, for the pre-Dorset people. These people were actually the first people uh, to move into the high eastern Arctic, probably about 4,000 years ago. They're generally assumed, in, in the common knowledge, to have fished for Arctic char. They would have done this in the late summer. The problem is, is that there's really a paper-thin record uh, for direct evidence of fishing. Uh, for example, we have an incredibly rich archaeological record on Iglulik Island. At a site called Lion Hill, for example, well over 100 archaeological features have been examined. Uh, not a single fishbone was reported. Um, so based on this site and many others like it, it kind of really looks to me like uh, Arctic char wasn't really an important part of the pre-Dorset adaptation to the high Arctic. <clears throat> the researchers are having the same problem in northern Finland. Uh, we have hunter-gatherers there, uh, hunter-gatherer groups there about 7,000 years ago. Uh, some of my colleagues have been studying sites of these people along the Joki River. Uh, it turns out, you know, they, they expect that people were salmon fishing along these rivers. These rivers are very rich in salmon. There's really nothing. They have maybe two, three salmon bones for the whole Kind of length of it. So um, we went there to try to solve this problem uh, this past summer and you know, take some sediment samples, do some fine sieving, all that. Turns out that just bone in general of any sort was virtually impossible to come by. Uh, very, very poorly preserved, tiny little particles that, uh, you know, virtually unidentifiable in the field. I mean, you have really have to fine sieve those. And this was the result of poor preservation. And of course, what we have here uh, is a pod soil, uh, typical of the region, very wet uh, in acidic conditions. Uh, not a good situation for salmon bone. The fish bone in particular has uh, several characteristics that make it susceptible to rapid decompositions in these types of soils. First of all, it's exceptionally porous. And this exposes much of the collagen and mineral surfaces uh, directly to chemical and physical weathering processes. Then there's the amount of organic matter. We can see here that uh, after uh, treatment, uh, this bone contains about 40% organic matter. That's over double the amount of organic matter bone typically has. 
which is around 20 percent 15 20 percent of course <clears throat> problem here is that this greater amount of organic matter invites greater microbial activity uh, so there's a lot more bio erosion that can happen in these types of bones uh, with this bio erosion of course this further increases the porosity of the mineral further exposing the mineral surface area to acids and soils and sediments <clears throat> And then we have a problem with the structure of the collagen and its interfacing with the mineral component. And here we have a comparison uh, of the infrared spectra of caribou on top and salmon on the bottom. Uh, one of the first things we can notice immediately, oh I should clarify that this is a, an extract of collagen. It's not the full bone, the collagen is extracted so we can see the, the components, the secondary components of the polypeptide chain a lot better. Uh, so the first thing that jumps out is the 1655 peak here. It covers far less area in the salmon, far greater area in the caribou. And what this indicates is the uh, collagen bundle packing. So collagen uh, has three strands, uh, triple helical. Uh, those are very loosely wrapped up and it's indicated by this in the IR spectra. So again, that gives more area for microbes to attack. Uh, then we have the 1630 peak here. It's quite a bit bigger, uh, more pronounced than the caribou. This is from uh, hydroxyproline. Um, what this does is it provides hydroxyl groups that, pr that uh, facilitate the bonding between the mineral and the organic component. There's much less of this. Uh, in salmon bone. So again, causes problems for preservation. So, the whole goal of my project is to figure out how to solve this issue. Uh, of course, one way to solve this issue is to look at sedimentary proxies uh, for fish remains. I think waste management strategies uh, are going to provide some pretty good evidence, uh, pretty good pro proxy evidence for fish bone. Why is this? Uh, I spent a lot of time living with Inuit people uh, during my work in the Canadian Arctic, and we did quite a bit of fishing. You know, it was kind of essential. I mean, when you're living off spam in the Arctic, you kind of want to go fishing every day after work. <laughs> so we ate quite a lot of Arctic char, and we would always kind of do the same thing with it. We, you know, we would skin it. Um, slice it up so we could dry it into what the local people call pitsik. Uh, we'd make soup with the heads and we'd take the spines and turf them in our fire. Uh, and I mean, waste disposal like this, <laughs> this is very deep history. I mean, it's probably the oldest form of waste disposal, no? I mean, it's ubiquitous among past hunter-gatherers. So the argument here is that uh, the domestic hearths uh, of salmonid fishers would have likely acted as nodes uh, for salmon bone refuse. <clears throat> so on to the experiment and the mineralogical classification. You know, all based on this premise, I mean, the main goal of this component of the project is to determine whether burned salmonid bone has any diagnostic mineralogical traits that we can t that we can t detect uh, in hearth sediments. So I'll just uh, kind of quickly go over the results. Um, of course, this is based on laboratory incineration experiments uh, using a muffle furnace. Uh, bones, salmon bones, were burned uh, between temperatures of 100 degrees and 1,000 degrees at one uh, 100 degree intervals for one hour at each interval. <clears throat> and of course all this was done in triplicate and of course it wouldn't be an experiment if you didn't have controls so I had a series of controls all animals that uh, are abundant in the North American Arctic so we have caribou uh, moose um, we have cod uh, duck and ptarmigan which is also known as a uh, uh, snow chicken five minutes wow Okay, so let me blow through the results here. Uh, starting off, we can see that the caribou and the salmon have some differences. Uh, the salmon has far more fat. Uh, the mineral component is the same. Uh, salmon has less carbonate. 
we start to see some really interesting change at about 500 degrees. And what we're seeing here is the appearance of uh, 1150 peak, uh, 1120, 1046, uh, 990, all diagnostic of the mineral Whitlockite. Uh, Whitlockite is a rare, uh, uncommon magnesium calcium phosphate. Uh, we know that it can form in granite, granite pegmatite uh, through uh, in dental calculus, it's been found in cave sediments. Now we also have some evidence that it forms in salmon bone burned at 500 degrees. <clears throat> I keep thinking this is the clicker, but it's not. Um, here we have the x-ray diffraction confirmation that uh, this is in fact Whitlockite. Uh, we have the key peaks here outlined in blue. On top we have the regular diffractogram. On bottom the results of the Breidfeldt refinement, which separates and quantifies the mineral phases. We can see we have a very small amount of Whitlockite. We also know it's Whitlockite because of the calcium to phosphate ratio of uh, 1.38. <clears throat> For this to form, we need an abundance of magnesium. This was confirmed through the SEM EDS analysis. And then at 600 degrees, things are really starting to get interesting. So what we have here is the uh, formation of a tricalcium phosphate mineral out of the Whitlockite. Uh, so we lose the Whitlockite peak here, the 1120 gets much stronger. We get a 1075, 1046, all these peaks, diagnostic tricalcium phosphate. Strange thing is though, is the 984 and 945. Uh, these should be at 970 and 940, but they're shifted slightly. The reason for this is because there's so much magnesium present in the mineral lattice. Why this is, is that uh, magnesium has substituted calcium. Uh, the magnesium ion is a little bit smaller so it causes the lattice to contract, causes these peaks to shift. So we know that we have a lot of magnesium uh, present in the mineral. <clears throat> Here we have again the confirmation uh, for beta magnesium tricalcium phosphate at 600, uh, pretty well formed, 17 to 20% formed. And again, with the calcium plus magnesium to phosphate ratio of 1.53, that's pretty much dead on uh, with what it should be for this mineral. So why does this happen? It happens because of the large amount of organic matter and the large amount of magnesium in the salmon bone. We can see here that at four to 500, we're losing a lot of weight in the salmon bone. That's because of the organic matter, specifically the fat. So this combusts. What happens is it's causing a temperature spike, uh, localized. You know, the oven says 600, but within the bone itself, it's, it's a, a bursting in temperature. We know this because we've lost the carbonate at 600 degrees. We shouldn't lose the carbonate until 700 plus. So there must be a temperature spike. <clears throat> uh, 800 degrees showing no formation in caribou, nor did it form in any of the other animals, but a very well formation uh, in salmon at 800 degrees. Confirmation through XRD, we can see that a lot of the mineral has formed, 60%. <clears throat> so we need to know about formation potential. Can this form in a hunter-gatherer hearth? Absolutely. Uh, hunter-gatherer hearths, I think in this area, would range likely between six and 800 degrees. Shouldn't be a problem to reach the temperature to form the mineral. I don't think these hearths are gonna go anywhere near a thousand. Uh, this mineral has been documented in other animal bones at temperatures over a thousand, but I don't really think we need to worry about that because in all the hearths that I've examined uh, with all the bone, all of the bone that's been examined with IR uh, shows maximum temperatures of around 700. Okay, so this is just a comparison of when and when it doesn't form. So we'll just skip through that. Take my word for it, it forms in salmonids at 600. Uh, we get a little tiny bit of formation in other animals at 1,000 plus, but I don't think that's going to be able to be possible in a hunter-gatherer hearth. Uh, there are some other differences that we can use to distinguish it. We can talk about these later if you're so inclined. I think it has good preservation potential because when we're getting up at these temperatures, our SEM here shows that the mineral crystals are sintering. So it's exposing uh, less surface area for decomposition. Uh, it's making a more robust uh, uh, mineral aggregate, basically. And I think that um, 
concentrations of burned bones in hearths are going to create alkaline conditions. Uh, I have some evidence from this from several sites that I've worked on. So I think uh, if a lot of bone is burned in the hearth, this localized alkaline condition will uh, benefit the preservation of the bone. So lastly, just to wrap it up, uh, this methodology is going to be applied at a site in Alaska called Upward Sun River. That's 11,500 years old. It contains the oldest confirmed salmonid remains in the New World, and they are certainly burned. So this site is going to be a perfect case study uh, for studying the merits and limitations uh, of this methodology for identifying salmonid remains among northern hunter-gatherers. And I'd like to thank my funding sources. Again, thanks for inviting me.